So thank you everyone for attending today. Today I'm going to talk about our recent work for uh, critical infrastructure resilience. So uh, first of all, like I, like we can we can hear this uh, regular term like critical infrastructure and critical infrastructure system. So what does this actually mean? Like in my, in our context, we define like critical infrastructure as like any cyber or physical connected systems which are essential to the function of our economics and modern society uh, this includes like uh, power production water systems hydro power dams transportation communications uh, in united states actually there are 16 sectors defined as uh, critical infrastructure uh, and those like uh, what we mean uh, in our title by critical infrastructure systems so as those systems are very important to our lives, it was crucial to maintain their operation. So, measuring or defining the operation of uh, critical infrastructure, we have like multiple metrics in uh, literature that can be used, or multi multiple definitions. One of those is resilience. Like there are reliability and resilience. I'm here targeting the resilience of critical infrastructure. So what's resilience actually is? Resilience usually is defined in literature as the ability of a system or critical infrastructure to adapt, withstand, or rapidly recover from external failures. Those failures are uh, man-made mistakes or uh, man-made faults induced to the system or natural disasters that can affect our system. Examples of those are like flooding, extreme temperature, earthquakes, hurricanes, cyber attacks, normal wear and tear of the critical infrastructure. So when we are studying resilience, usually we need to define which critical infrastructure we are working on and which type of these attacks we make our critical infrastructure resilient against. When studying these problems of critical infrastructure resilience, there are usually some major challenges. Of those are, there are multiple critical infrastructure domains, as I just mentioned, like there are transportation, communications, water, dams, nuclear reactors. So every type of this infrastructure needs a different approach of targeting its resilience. Of, uh, of these challenges also, some approaches study the system resilience as a whole, and the other approaches study just the individual infrastructure resilience. For example, some, some approaches can study the resilience of the whole power grid. Some others can study only generators, the resilience of individual generators. Those also add to the diversity of uh, research in uh, critical infrastructure resilience. Another major challenge is that critical infrastructure are usually interdependent. The output or the uh, uh, the output of one infrastructure can affect uh, uh, another infrastructure. The failure of one infrastructure can also affect another infrastructure and so on. Variable disruptive events, I just mentioned, hurricanes, flooding, earthquakes, and so on. And one, one more th major thing here is there are actually literature different resilience perspectives. So resilience, as I just mentioned, like can have multiple definitions. Like, the ability of a system to withstand or quickly recover or so on. So all these are different perspectives for studying resilience. I want like to make, highlight some of those perspectives uh, that are used in literature. So for example, like there, there are social or community resilience. Those type of research like targets how a community will be affected in the case of failure of specific infrastructure. Uh, another aspect of measuring uh, resilience is the economic losses of failure due to failure. Like if some infrastructure has failure or has fallen uh, for some reason. So how much are the economic costs uh, or losses due to this failure? Some other approaches are more technical that target the restoration time after failure. So after my infrastructure goes to failure, like how quickly can it recover to its normal operation? or the effect on critical infrastructure against specific events. So if some event like that affects my system, how much my system will be affected as a percentage of its nominal output? And finally, 
of this is appropriate of failure. So how likely the critical infrastructure will fail due to specific disruptive events? Those all make the research in critical infrastructure resilience very diverse and has, more, has a lot of challenges to target specific, uh, one of these specific challenges, actually. So in our model, so brief, before going to our, our model, like we, I, I listed the limitations of the prior studies that I just mentioned, like due to these uh, challenges in uh, critical infrastructure resilience. First of these, critical infrastructure component, components are usually abstracted within the system. So if you are studying the resilience of a power generator, like a uh, power unit that generate, that provide electricity, usually in previous research, they consider it as a whole. They don't get deeper into the components of this critical infrastructure. Also, individual critical infrastructure is not considered for large-scale large interconnected critical infrastructure. This is measured for entire system, not individual one. Rather, like, the first point is what I mean, the internal components of one individual critical infrastructure. The second point is, like, in a system of multiple inter infra interconnected infrastructures, like, some, some or many research target the whole system, not the individual critical infrastructure. And finally, the source allocation techniques, which I, I will mention later, consider each critical infrastructure as a black box. It doesn't actually tell you how to improve the resilience. It just give a measurement for the whole system, but it doesn't tell you, okay, how you are going to improve the resilience within an individual critical infrastructure. And I'm going to target this today in my research. So based on these limitations, the system model we are considering in this world we consider a cyber physical system of multiple critical infrastructure. So we first consider like multiple, not individual critical infrastructure. But within this system, we evaluate the resilience of each individual critical infrastructure against its internal components failure based on its probability of failure. So I'm considering a system of multiple critical infrastructure. Then I target one of these or like in each of these critical infrastructure. I'm measuring the probability of failure of this critical infrastructure against its internal components probability of failures. The failure here, like when I mentioned the word failure in my research, I mean the inability of critical infrastructure to provide its intended function. I don't mean like the collapse of the building. I mean like if I have a critical infrastructure that's supposed to provide some service, failure here means that infrastructure is not able to provide the service. We, de we, we developed like a state to model our system that are, we consider the infrastructure to be in either success state, warning state, or failure state. Success state is like everything is working perfectly in the system, no errors, no, nothing wrong with the system. So we can consider it as being success state. Failure is a complete failure of the system when it cannot provide its function anymore. Warning, which is a most important state in our model is a state in which the system has some internal failures, but it's still able to provide its function. So there are failures, but it didn't affect the whole infrastructure failure. Uh, so like this is, these are the states I just mentioned in my uh, previous slide, which are warning, success, failure. And we define the mark of a chain of these probabilities. Like success, warning, failure, and we have three probabilities for each one of those. Like I can be, I can stay in the same state or I can move to any of the other two states for every one of those states. And I mentioned warning state, the one we focus much up in our system because it uh, spies the system when there are internal failures, but it didn't cause us, the whole system to go to complete failure. The probability PWF actually is the probability that defines when the system will go to failure when it's in warning state. This, uh, this specific probability is actually very important in our work. Because in our way we define the resilience, or we, we define the resilience is against internal components failure. So what we want is, 
If there are failures in the internal components of the system, we don't want the system to go to failure state. We want the system to recover to a success state again or uh, remain in the warning state, but not to go to failure state. So our focus from now on then will be on, 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 why to, on how to improve this probability, probability of be, uh, transitioning from warning to failure states. To do this, actually, we define a Bayesian network. So this Bayesian network will model every internal, not every, like, will model most uh, internal components of a critical infrastructure in a hierarchical view. And the output of this Bayesian network, as I will mention, uh, as, I, as I will discuss later, will specify the probability of transitioning from warning to failure. And uh, the relation between those, like we, in, in our system, we will compute the probability from the Bayesian network and look out to how to improve this probability within the Bayesian network in order to improve this probability, WF, which, we'll, we'll, we, which we will use in our resilience index. It's noteworthy also that, like there are some other uh, disruptive events that can cause the system to move directly or to go directly from success state to failure state. Like if there is, like for example, earthquake that destroys the whole building. This probability we, we will not be able to capture in our probability PWF because we are only considering internal failures or components. This probability can be captured actually with the probability transitioning from success to failure state, but we are not targeting this in our model. We are just focusing on probability of uh, transitioning from warning to failure state. So, how we, how, how we define a resilience index for, for our system or for our, for our model. We start by the Markovic chain, having all these probabilities. We made the definition of our resilience to be the inverse of the probability of being in a failure state on the long run. So we study the system like over uh, many steps, many time steps, which is we define as a long run, like when n, when n, which is the number of steps, tends to infinity, and the inverse of the probability of being in failure state will define our resilience. So what, what, what are this probability u and f? It's actually the failure component in the probability transition vector at time step n. So at, at every time step n, I, I have three probabilities for the whole system to be in either of success or warning or failure, or fa failure state. So we study this component, which is the probability of being in failure state. And we can actually calculate this probability using our probability transition matrix. If we have this probability transition matrix defining all these probabilities for, for transitioning from one state to, to another, we can multiply this by the initial probability distribution vector and multiply it by this probability raised to the power n, which is the number of time steps, to get the probability distribution vector at every time step. So before we go into this deep into these calculations, I just want to mention that we made some assumptions in this probability transition matrix. We assume that this probability, which is dashed line PFW, we assume it to be zero. By this, we mean that once the infrastructure is in a failure state, it should be, returned, it should be recovered to a success state, not to a warning state. That's actually not like an essential assumption our component. Like our system still holds if this probability has any value. But like all the following calculations and uh, uh, proofs were made on the, this assumption just for analytical tractability. But like we still apply this system for other values of PFW and the system works. The other uh, uh, probability we assumed is the probability of being in warning state. Like if I'm warning state, I'm continuing in warning state. We assume this probability to have a known value depends on like the actions taken on the system. Like if I'm taking frequent actions on the system or I'm just leaving the system unattended. So we, we assume this to be a known probability with some value. So starting from this probability transition matrix, we were able to prove that our probability is a regular Markov matrix. And what this means is that if I raise this probability to any power n, like as the number of time steps increases, the probability will actually converge to a constant matrix. This 
uh, proof actually is very important because it means that this probability itself will be fixed, will be constant at some point of time. So this vector will not anymore depend on the initial probability distribution. So it doesn't matter what state my system in at this current time. As, uh, as I go on over time, this probability will be shaped to a constant matrix, and this will, and by this I can just calculate the probability distribution over this at this uh, time step. So based on this proof, we were able to prove that our resilience matrix here, our resilience metric here, because this value will be a constant value at some point. It will look like be an infinite or unbounded value. So this value in total of our resilience will be bounded and will have a real number. But this number in itself is not very is not, is not like very informative because it can have like any number that can be range from like one or uh, to to very high numbers. So what we did is we defined another matrix is our resilience index, which is a normalized resilience is our value of the resilience divided by the maximum resilience I can achieve, and I just like will postpone this value gamma maximum until I uh, get to my Bayesian network system. So by this, the value of theta will be, any, will be a value between zero and one. So this will be useful if I will need to compare multiple critical infrastructure, I will have like one uh, value ranging between zero and one. So I can know like where is my critical infrastructure is from its maximum resilience I can achieve. Uh, just to give some examples of the convergence of this probability matrix P when it's raised to power n, we did like some, we ran some simulations with for three different critical infrastructure having uh, different uh, starting probabilities, like having different probabilities of P, like one of them like is, 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 uh, has like higher probabilities of being in success state, the other high, has higher probability of being in warning state, initial probability, and the other has higher, uh, higher probability of being in failure state. And we studied if all these systems, just for a matter of simulation, ha in how many time steps will these systems converge? And usually we can find like after four, six iterations, like all these probabilities come to a, the constant value that we are targeting. It was approved analytically in this part, but this just gave an intuition of uh, how many time steps are needed for our system to converge. We actually show here the probability of success over time steps, and again, the probability of being in warning state over time steps. So after we defined the Markovitch chain and we had a solid definition for our resilience and resilience index, what's remaining is the probability I mentioned at the beginning, probability of transitioning from warning to failure. So how can we get a, like, a value for this probability? We designed actually a Bayesian network in a hierarchical way to model the effect of the failure of one level component to the other failure. So we start by infrastructure, we model like all possible internal components, and we measure how those components in one level will affect the, pro the components on the other level. By this, we can uh, calculate the total effect on our system, which is the last node here in our uh, Bayesian network tree, uh, based on every one of these uh, internal components. Uh, from this, what as I as I have shown in like the previous figure, this probability will should as should now define the probability of transitioning from warning to failure. I can close in this picture. Like in this Bayesian network, as every one of those, I'm considering its failure effect on the cascading failure of the total system, and those failures happen to due to the internal components. So this probability, which we calculate from the Bayesian network, will model our probability of uh, transitioning from warning to failure. And then we can plug in, to plug in these values into our resilience model to, to calculate the value of the resilience of our system. So one thing to note here about this design of the Bayesian network, if someone is familiar with reliability 
of systems. This design is kind of similar to what's known as fault trees. Fault trees actually are widely used in reliability analysis of the system to, the, to, the, to measure the effect of internal components. So what is the difference between using Bayesian network and using regular fault trees? The main advantage actually of using Bayesian network is that we can define different probabilities on these things. So for one component, I can have the previous level component have different effects on its probability of failure. So in other words, not all the components affect its next level component with the same value. It can affect with different values based on the probabilities assigned to these things. That's one major difference actually between fault trees. Fault trees are actually just AND and OR gates. So I'm just combining multiple values to have an effect or uh, either AND or OR gates. This, that, that, that's one uh, advantage of using Bayesian network. But the other advantage which we use here is the inference of the Bayesian network. So from the Bayesian network, we can inference and calculate these specific probabilities based on specific events. So what we did in this work is we defined an algorithm using the Bayesian network we just mentioned. This algorithm is used to prioritize the, the internal components of an infrastructure based on their effect on the probability of transitioning from warning to failure. So as I mentioned, the resilience depends on this probability. We need to improve this probability. So where to start? Which component has the most effect on the probability of failure? That was actually this algorithm can tell us. So we start by calculating the marginal probability of failure for the whole system based on the current probabilities, actually, without changing anything in the system. So I'm, I'm, I'm measuring, OK, in, in, my, in my situation, given the, the current probability of failures for every component, what is the total probability of failure of our system? And then we try to calculate the posterior marginal probability for fixing every component. So I do this for n here means like the last node, which is the total probability of failure. And i is every node in, the, in my system. So I'm calculating this probability. And this probability actually means it's a conditional probability, means that I'm calculating this probability given that I fix this probability to some value. I, I'm considering it as now an evidence variable in my network. So what is the value of this probability xi? Xi actually is the maximum I can get from one component. So for example, if I have a faulty component in my system and I want to change this with a new one, every component comes with some reliability. I know that this, this component is like 0.99 reliable. So its probability of failure now reduces to 0.01. And I plug in this value into my calculations. So I use this value for every node in my system. I calculate this. And at the same time, I calculate the difference between this probability and the probability when I fix one component. So I have the initial probability, and I'm calculating the effect of every of fixing every component on the total probability of failure. By this, I can sort all these components and get the most component that can affect my system. But I cannot just stick here and say, OK, now I have a sort or an order for all the components, and I can use them. Because in Bayesian networks, if you fix one component, you need to do every calculations again. Because this fix will affect the total probability of failure and will affect all the following components. So what we do next is we do the same, but this time the component we fix here, we use it as an evidence variable, just one component. At this step, we fix the most, uh, the, the component that has the most effect on the probability of failure. We use it in the next step as an evidence variable. It's, it's, it's a given, and we, we, we do the same process again. We check all the remaining components to get the second most uh, component that affects the probability of failure, and we repeat this process until we, ha we can have a valid order for all the system components uh, according to their effect on probability of failure of my system. This algorithm we, de we developed actually has a, a complexity of uh, it's a, has a polynomial complexity because usually in Bayesian network the inference to, to calculate some probabilities is NP hard unless if you have 
a singly connected Bayesian network. That means we have only one path from each node to the root. By this, you can actually calculate or drive the equations and drive these probabilities to solve your system. So, in this case, if we look at our Bayesian network in this slide, it's obvious that this I have only one pair from each node to the total probability of failure, and I can uh, solve this polynomial, uh, so solve this algorithm or get inference from this Bayesian network in polynomial time. So, what is what what is the case if the structure of this Bayesian network has changed? Like, if I have like multiple roots from one root to, to another. When the system still holds or not. So what actually can happen in this case? We will not be able anymore to drive the solution analytically. But we can still use multiple, uh, uh, like one of the many available algorithms that can give inference from this Bayesian network. Like there are actual multi many algorithms that can inference. And in this case, the running time will depend on the structure of the Bayesian network. It will not be polynomial. It might not be undefined, but most of these algorithms can converge and get you inference from this property. We didn't do this in our work. We just stick to the simple case, which the Bayesian network is singly connected. But like this can be like an extension in the future. So this actually. Uh, a picture of uh, the software I was using to calculate the Bayesian inference. It's it's called SAM IM. Uh, that's the name of the software. It's developed by Adnan Darwish, I think from UCLA. I'm not sure. But like it's it's a well-known software that you can model this uh, this network, these nodes, and calculate the probability of failure. In this case, like these nodes in red are the nodes I already fixed. Like I assume that I can fix these components, so the the probability of failure is known to be like zero or some other values, and I'm using them as evidence variable to calculate the effect on the total probability of failure. And then the algorithm should actually continue after this, like if I have these three nodes known to in their final order, I can continue in the same network to uh, compute the order of every component. So at this point, before going to the, uh, the second part of uh, my framework, at this point, what do we have? We have a resilience index defined in terms of the probabilities of the system. We have a Bayesian network that can tell every infrastructure what is the order to fix the components within the critical infrastructure. So we dig into the internal, so the internal components level of the infrastructure, and we can now have uh, a resilience index of the individual infrastructure. So. What about the rest of infrastructure? Because our model says that we have multiple infrastructure. How can we deal with this? So what we assumed here is we assume that we have a system operator that can manage multiple critical infrastructure and wants to improve the total system resilience uh, from this critical infrastructure. So that's the system operator in our case is going to allocate some resources to improve this, uh, the resilience of this individual critical infrastructure. So what those resources are? This resource actually can be monitoring resources such as drones that can reach like hard to reach places in the critical infrastructure. Can be just surveillance systems. Can be maintenance crew that can quickly fix uh, any failure in the system. It can be cyber secure cyber resources if my system has cyber components. All these can be included at resources that can be allocated from a system operator. And the system operator has multiple critical infrastructure. They can be from the same type, like all can be nuclear reactors, or all can be smart grids, or they can be different. Uh, but the goal is to allocate these resources. So the problem of resource allocation actually within multiple critical infrastructure can be solved in many ways. The one method we use here is use something called contracts. Contracts is the, uh, some, some, like agreement from the system operator to provide resources for a critical infrastructure and then gain, gain some rewards in, uh, for these uh, resources. What actually we are building on is contract theory, which is a Nobel Prize winning theory. In this, in this theory, actually, 
or the, the contract theory in general deals with situations where we have multiple decision makers, but only one of them has the all power to design these contracts and give offers or contracts to the other decision makers. The other decision makers can only choose to accept or not these uh, contracts. So in this way, we found that contract theory will be very suitable to model our problem because we have a system operator that is, that is interested in uh, improving the resilience for the whole system. It's designing contracts and giving those to individual infrastructure. And individual infrastructure can just choose to accept or not these offers. So for example, if I'm giving you a, an agreement, I'm going to give you this amount of resources and you are giving me money back for these resources. And you are going to use these resources to improve your resilience. So these contracts are actually take this form, like two term agreement, number of resources allocated from the system operator to the critical infrastructure and the reward of these uh, resources. So if I am an infrastructure and I am offered like a contract that you will be given this amount of resources and you should give me this amount of money, how can the infrastructure evaluate these resources? Like, I, how can I calculate if this, if this agreement is useful for me or not? We did uh, an evaluation function here for the each infrastructure based on the Bayesian network. So wh what we did is we measure the, we evaluate the resources at each infrastructure as the improvement in resilience after using these resources and before using these resources. And again, how can the infrastructure use these resources is according to the Bayesian algorithm it has. It has a prioritization for the components. So I'm, I'm going to apply these components in order. If, I, if, I, if you are giving me some resources, I'm going to apply these resources to these components in order. And I'm going to measure that how improvement I can get from these resources based on this allocation. So, to study this system, like for some practical examples, or one example, we defined here a system of hydropower dams that can generate electricity and provide them provide electricity to the power grid. By this, we can like the, the reason we choose uh, hydropower dams because they are critical infrastructure and they are interconnected with the power grid. So we can measure the, the effect on power grid. And here we define, like as I mentioned, we define the function of power grid to be delivering electricity. So failure in this case means that power grid is not able to provide electricity for the reasons we can see. To do this, we designed an actual Bayesian network for hydropower dams. Like this part of the uh, Bayesian network we have designed, like hydropower dams have internal components and these components can affect the failure or the electricity generation in some way. So we model like the actual network we worked on, like it's bigger than this, but like this is a part of the network to give an idea of what we are doing. So we measure like if this has failure, how, how it will affect the other components and so on. So to this end, we said that we are going to use contract theory to design these contracts. We showed how the infrastructure will evaluate the resources. So how, can, how does this problem look like actually? The problem of optimal resource allocation. So in this case, the problem is designed by the system operator itself. So the system operator wants to maximize its reward from allocating these resources according to this utility function, which in, is in the first line. So this utility function says that the amount I'm gaining from these resources should be higher than the expected losses for, from these dams failure. If some dam has some failure and cannot provide electricity, I know that there will be changes in the, in the system. So is this change actually depend on the amount of power generation. So this value of PI is the amount of power generation for this uh, hydropower dam. We model this, I'm not going to give details for these specific values because they are uh, very specific to uh, the prices of the expected power losses after uh, them. Actually, we, in our model, we used close to real values for the current prices 
and uh, the prices at time of emergency uh, due to like failure or uh, power cut at some uh, uh, power generation unit. So we use this uh, as, a, as a utility of uh, the, the system operator. But in, in contract theory, your optimization problem is not just you are optimizing your reward. You still need to take into consideration some other actions. The most important constraint in contract theory is usually individual rationality constraint. This constraint is not for the system operator itself, it's for the other critical infrastructure. What this says simply is that for, for a critical infrastructure to accept your offer, to accept your contract, he needs to have a positive utility. You cannot give him a contract that will, him, will, will, will allow him to lose money. So in this, we use the evaluation function for every infrastructure in this part. And we should have a constraint that this evaluation function for every infrastructure should at least be equal to the money uh, that, that is paid back for this amount of resources. It can actually be higher, but it cannot be any way lower than this. Value. And this is like the importance or the uh, the importance of contract theory in designing this type of contracts. In this system, we assumed complete information that the uh, system operator knows this evaluation function and knows the Bayesian network for each in, for each in infrastructure in the system. Contract theory can also solve other problems which these values are not known. And in this case, the system will not, be, will not have complete information. It will have like asymmetric information or incomplete information. And in this case, we need to add more constraints. The most important of them is called incentive compatibility that allows the system operator to design contracts for specific types without knowing these types. We didn't cover this part in, our, in this work, but we did it in a separate work in a different context the problem of resource allocation under for critical infrastructure under a symmetric approach. If we are going to solve this optimization problem, one thing to notice here is this function, evaluation function in this line is a discrete function. It's not a continuous function because we are, so, uh, we are fixing components based on what, some order and we are calculating the evaluation uh, resulting from fixing this component. So that makes all our system or our problem is discrete. One way to solve discrete uh, optimization problems we followed here is dynamic programming, as we are going into all the possible details, assigning them from the end and going back into steps until we can allocate all these resources. So in each time step here, in each stage in, the, in our dynamic programming problem, we have is the number of allocated resources at this point. We start by allocating all the resources, for example, to one dam, and at each time step, going backward, we are deducting, uh, we are changing this allocation. We found that the complexity of our dynamic programming algorithm is big in, which is the number of infrastructure, times R max minus R max. And R max actually is the maximum number of resources that will be allocated to one dam in this system, and our minimum is the minimum number to be allocated. To get an idea of those values, so first, before we can get uh, to the results and see these values, how, how they change, I want just to conclude our whole framework as a flowchart in this um, figure. So how our system actually works, we defined multiple stages in our system. We defined there is a Markovic chain, we defined the Bayesian network, we defined resource allocation using contract theory. How all this system will work in steps? So we start by one system, we use the Bayesian network to calculate the energy initial probability according to success for the infrastructure. Here, like we assumed at the beginning, we know the value of theta. Uh, so knowing the probability of warning to failure, I can easily calculate the probability of problem of success as long as I know the value of uh, it was epsilon actually uh, at the first initial transition probability. So what I mean by this is a prob is like knowing the probability of transition from warning to failure is the same as knowing the probability of warning to success. So in, uh, I start the system. I calculate the initial probability. Then I calculate the resilience index based on this. So now what is? Gamma maximum I mentioned previously. Uh, 
is the maximum resilience I can achieve from this system if I fix it all the components to their new values. Like if, if I change it all the faulty components in my system with newer values. So what will be the maximum resilience? This might be theoretical. I might not be able to change everything in my system, but this can give me an intuition of where I am from the optimal uh, resilience I can achieve. So we calculate the resilience. So and then we do this for every infrastructure. We calculate its probability of failure and its resilience index. Then we use that we solve the dynamic programming algorithm for the system operator. And the system operator is going to allocate these resources after solving the, progr the uh, dynamic programming problem to this infrastructure. Each infrastructure now will allocate these resources internally to its internal components based on the algorithm we defined, we developed from the Bayesian network. And then we can calculate the new resilience indexes for uh, individual infrastructure and uh, for the whole system from this. Some results from our work. Uh, in our uh, simulations, we considered only two uh, hydropower dams because we developed two different Bayesian networks for these hydropower dams. So this figure tells you what is the dam's utility if it's using the resources and the evaluation function. So we can notice that there is, this, if this is zero, there is a maximum number of resources according to our Bayesian design that can give the dam positive utility. And actually, this is the individual rationality constraint. In this constraint, it says that, like, for example, this first dam can have a maximum of 15 resources allocated. Because if it accepted uh, or if it used more resources, the gain from the Bayesian network due to allocating these resources cannot overweight the rewards paid in these resources. For the second dam, again, we can find that the maximum here is 15. So if like the R1 maximum, the maximum resources that uh, infrastructure one can accept is 15 units of resources. And for second one is, for the second infrastructure is 15 units of resources. Uh, the complexity of our algorithm in this case, will, we will use this number, like which is the maximum of both. This is, like we are not going to start our algorithm from allocating like the whole 20 resources. We just started from 15 resources because we know like no infrastructure will accept resources more than 50. Uh, continuing into results. So this figure now is the utility of the system operator. And we have here two critical infrastructure of two dams, one in red and one in blue. And this shows the utility of allocating each unit of resources to each of these dams. So if I allocated like five units of resources, to the second dam, this will be the utility of the system operator. And this, like, uh, if I allocated all the 20, which is not theoretically accepted, I will get this value. So what are these solid lines is what we just showed in the previous figure. We showed here that the maximum for infrastructure 1 is 15, and the maximum for infrastructure 2 is 15. So these lines are drawn for the first grid infrastructure. We have a solid line at 15. That means the system operator cannot consider these values actually. It just stops here because it's, those are not going to happen because the infrastructure won't accept this contract. The same for the second infrastructure, it's not going to accept contracts in this range. So after solving the dynamic programming in this, in this case, that was the dynamic, the optimal allocation, <coughs> which is allocating 15 units to the first dam and calculate, allocating 17, <coughs> seven units to the second dam that like, was calculated from the dynamic programming algorithm. So in this case, what this figure shows is actually the resilience index. And the resilience index in this case, that was the initial resilience index without allocate, allocating any resources. And this was the final resilience index due to allocating this resource. We can see that the resilience index here was like 0.5. It goes up to 80 something, which is actually 70% increase in the resilience index. For the second dam, I started like at 0.3 something and ended around 0.5, which was around 50% increase in, the, in its resilience index. More on results, we showed like uh, one figure 
called uh, uh, for the principal total for the principal total utility. We compared our algorithm, our allocation, which is the one in black, to other algorithms, actually, which is allocating the whole resources to either of these dams and the greedy algorithm, which is getting the maximum from each unit resource. But here in this figure, we compared this result to the reward per resources the system operator can charge. So in this case, I am a system operator and I want to design my contract. I want to specify a value for each uh, unit of resources I'm allocating to a critical infrastructure. So how can I get this value? Like in this figure, we can see that this is the reward per resources. If the uh, system operator chooses a reward per resource in this range, like it will lose, like actually, for, for, for itself. If it uses like in this range for the second name, it will not accept any of these values because it's uh, uh, according to its evaluation function and so on. What's actually interesting here is that we can see this, these algorithms here exceeds our proposed allocation in terms of utility. And this actually happens because in this case, in my algorithm, I'm assuming that one of the constraints in the problem, I'm allocating all the resources. So the system operator wants to allocate all, all the resources and get the most of these resources. So even if its utility is going to decrease after some amount of resources, it still wants to allocate everything. But in this situation, if I'm using greedy algorithm, actually the allocation stops at some point. So if the utility of the system operator is going to decrease, the system stops, doesn't allocate anymore. So that's why those values are just higher than our algorithm. We, we, we then like show another metric we developed is the average resilience, uh, 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 average resilience utility, which is combining both the, resili uh, the improvement as the resilience index and the average utility. Uh, of uh, the system operator, and we can see in this case, like when combining not only the utility, which they can achieve higher, but if we combine the improvement uh, due to these resources and the reward, like our algorithm will outperform those, just because like those uh, those other algorithms don't allocate every unit of resources, they stop at some point, so the resilience is not going to improve as much as in our. So as a conclusion for our work, we defined like a framework consisting of multiple stages. We defined the resilience index based from calculating calculated from Markovic chain representation of the system. We proposed the Bayesian network to model the internal components failures on the total probability of failure of the system. We plugged in this value into the resilience in, uh, index to calculate the actual value of the resilience index. We use uh, hydropower dams as a case study to evaluate our framework, and then we define the problem of resource allocation among multiple uh, critical infrastructure, and we solve it using uh, dynamic programming. Future directions of this work can include if my system can have not only one warning state, if I can have m multiple warning state based on the degree of the actual failure in the system, that actually would be interesting, and it was some, some, something similar was used in power systems, which is called uh, degraded uh, states, like where the output of the system cannot like reach its full output. When the system can work on like partial output of the system, we can consider this as a future direction. Uh, also, we can consider the case if the internal components of the system does not need the and, or needs different times to be fixed. So I'm not considering only the effect, the direct effect on the total probability of failure. I'm considering if the, uh, these components will require different times to be fixed. In this case, actually, the, everything will really change. The system, or the, the, the individual critical infrastructure might not, will not be able to use the same Bayesian algorithm we just developed because it now takes into consideration also the time it needs to fix these components, not the effect of these components. Uh, that's actually like, looks promising uh, research direction to uh, extend this work. Finally, thank you all for attending today. And 
if you have any questions.